Hi, everybody. My name is Max Fabian, and I'm the co-chair of the Engineer and Scale and Work Group at Big Science. In this video, we're going to have a series of short sections and talks by different parts of our group. First, I'll briefly describe our role and tell you about the current status of our code base and experiments. Then, we'll have a short introduction of the Jamzi supercomputer that provides the computational resources for our training grants. After that, we'll have two technical talks about the frameworks that we have chosen. Megatron LM from NVIDIA and DivSpeed Megatron integration from Microsoft, respectively. First, what is the purpose of the engineering working group? As some of you might know, one of the final goals of our workshop is a very large language model that would be useful for the broader research community. Unfortunately, training large transformers is not an easy task, especially if you want it to be resource efficient, that is to utilize the given hardware in the best possible way. To address this problem, we need to make sure that the code for experiments is both well tuned to the conditions it's used in and stable in terms of training performance, or at least that there is a way to recover the run without losing too much progress. Specifically, our group focuses on all challenges introduced by scaling transformer language models to tens and hundreds of billions of parameters. Our responsibilities include finding the appropriate well test framework for training very large language models, comparing the performance of different distributed training methods on the actual Genzai cluster, and making sure that the requirements of other working groups, such as modeling, evaluation, and carbon impact, are met. Now, currently, our progress is quite steady. We've tested multiple popular open source frameworks for large scale language model pre training, and after discussions, we chose to use a combination of Megatron LM and DeepSpeed as the one with both an extensive range of helpful features and high GPU utilization. You can already have a look at our repositories on GitHub. The first one contains a fork of Megatron DeepSpeed, and the second one contains the detailed descriptions of the infrastructure and our currently playing experiments. The first smaller experiment is scheduled to run in the coming weeks, and its goals will be to verify the performance and to produce a first small artifact for other working groups. It will be a 13 billion autoregressive language model trained on the English subset of OSCR. So basically, nothing fancy now. Of course, the final model will be much bigger. Currently, we're aiming at 200 billion parameters, and of course, the data set will be changed to a larger multilingual corpus compiled by the data sourcing group. Thank you for watching this video. Now, let's move on to the rest of the talks. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them here or write to our email. Les supercalculateurs, ce sont des grands instruments de la recherche, aussi importants qu'un satellite ou un télescope. On a besoin d'une grande machine pour concevoir de nouveaux algorithmes. Toute augmentation de calcul nous permet de pouvoir réouvrir le champ des possibles. Aujourd'hui, les avancées scientifiques vont de plus en plus vite. La simulation numérique a fortement contribué à cette accélération, portée par la technologie des supercalculateurs. Déjà, il y a un gros avantage de voir l'arrivée de Jean Zé en France, c'est que ça nous réouvre des possibilités de calcul. Donc avec des machines de la génération de Jean Zé, nous allons être enfin en capacité de pouvoir relever de nouveaux challenges scientifiques. Le supercalculateur Jean Zay, tirant son nom de l'un des fondateurs du CNRS, est la dernière acquisition de Genesi. Sa puissance est de 14 pétaflops. Il peut donc réaliser 14 millions de milliards d'opérations en une seconde, soit l'équivalent de 35 000 ordinateurs de bureau. Une puissance extrême, encadrée par une technologie éco-responsable. Ce qui fait que Jean Zé est innovante, c'est directement le refroidissement liquide. Donc c'est de l'eau chaude qui vient directement au contact des processeurs, qui fait que c'est une machine les plus économes de sa gamme. Plus d'un millier d'utilisateurs bénéficient de la technologie de Jean Zé. Ça va nous permettre de nous projeter pour aller plus loin et pouvoir brasser toute une continuité de climat entre les climats de passé, plus ou moins lointains, le présent et le futur. Des utilisations possibles dans tous les domaines scientifiques, comme la combustion, l'astrophysique et plus d'une dizaine d'autres. Les atouts de ce supercalculateur sont multiples. 
le supercalculateur Jonzé est le premier supercalculateur en France qui est dédié à la fois pour le calcul haute performance et pour l'intelligence artificielle. Avoir accès à Jonzé, c'est attaquer et surtout imaginer de nouvelles solutions à des problématiques que l'on ne pouvait pas traiter auparavant. Ah bah le fait qu'il y ait Jean Zé permet de nous projeter pour aller plus loin et puis ça va nous permettre de continuer à affiner nos résultats, de prendre en compte plus d'interactions. C'est une nouvelle façon de faire de la science. C'est la machine convergée la plus puissante d'Europe et c'est un formidable accélérateur de la science. Hi, I'm Jared Casper, a member of the Applied Deep Learning Research Group at NVIDIA, and I'm here to talk to you about Megatron, our project for scaling up transformer-based models to train on thousands of GPUs. Megatron has already been used directly by several companies and research institutions to train language models up to tens of billions of parameters. The technology and code has also made its way into several other projects and frameworks, such as BlenderBot and FairSeq at Facebook, and has been paired with projects like DeepSpeed that you'll hear about later. As I mentioned, our goal with Megatron is to use model parallelism to train transformer-based models that are billions of parameters. We wanted to have a low barrier of entry and the ability to build on top of our code base. So instead of developing a generic framework that applies model parallelism to an arbitrary model, we applied model parallelism directly to an existing code base. The result is that we can achieve high utilization and scale well to thousands of GPUs with a code base that is really flexible and readable. This makes it possible to integrate well with our frameworks like DeepSpeed with minimal code changes. Megatron supports two forms of model parallelism that can be used individually or in combination. Pipeline parallelism splits the model layer-wise across multiple devices. For example, when using two-way pipeline parallel, Layers 0, 1, and 2 would be on one device, and layers 3, 4, and 5 will be on the other. A model can be pipelined either using our own internal implementation in Megatron or by pairing Megatron with a framework like DeepSpeed. The other form of parallelism is tensor-level parallelism. Here, each layer is split across multiple devices. So in using two-way tensor parallel, both devices are computing different parts of all the layers in the model. These two forms of parallelism can be combined to split the model across a large number of GPUs in several ways and can be combined with traditional data parallelism to train, for an e train on an even larger number of GPUs. We can now look at how well Megatron scales on Selene, which is our in-house supercomputer made up of nodes of eight A100 GPUs. When using tensor parallelism alone within a node, the eight-way configuration achieves 75% of the per-GPU throughput that a run with no model parallelism achieves. When we add in data parallelism, we can achieve similar scaling up to over 1,000 GPUs, maintaining close to 50% of the theoretical peak flops across all GPUs. Note that this is averaged across the entire run, not measuring peak throughput. When we combine tensor, pipeline, and data parallelism, we can scale up to a model with 1 trillion parameters. Note that these are benchmark runs and we have not trained all of these models to convergence. We could have benchmarked models larger than 1 trillion, or these same models on fewer GPUs, but are only interested in configurations that can train to convergence in a reasonable amount of time. These runs were performed with our internal implementation of pipeline parallelism. The results showed that we can scale near linearly all the way up to over 3,000 GPUs, achieving approximately 500 petaflops per second, which is nearly 50% of the peak throughput. All of this code is currently available on our public GitHub right now. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Samim Raj Bhandari. I'm the principal architect at the Microsoft DeepSpeed team, and in this video I'll talk about the integration between DeepSpeed and Megatron for big science with the aim of improving accessibility, efficiency, and flexibility. Let's take a quick step back and talk about some of the system requirements for training a really large model. Uh, from a memory perspective, training a 200 billion parameter model requires five to six terabytes of memory. That's nearly 200 NVIDIA V100 GPUs, each with 32 gigabytes of memory. From an efficiency requirement, in order to train on a large number of GPUs, we must limit the communication across GPUs uh, to prevent the communication from being a bottleneck. 
In order to satisfy both these requirements, we use um, a technology called 3D parallelism that combines tensor slicing for partitioning individual operators um, in the model within GPUs in a compute node. It uses pipeline parallelism across layers and across compute nodes. And once the model can fit using tensor slicing and pipeline parallelism, it uses data parallelism to scale to a large number of GPUs. So in our integrated solution, we use Megatron for tensor slicing and we use DeepSpeed for pipeline parallelism and data parallelism. So using DeepSpeed in this way gives access to additional features inside DeepSpeed that can help improve accessibility, efficiency throughput, and flexibility that goes beyond uh, just 3D parallelism. So let's first talk about accessibility. Uh, from an accessibility point of view, very few institutions actually have access to clusters with hundreds of GPUs that is required to train or fine tune a model with hundreds of billions of parameters. At this scale for fine tuning, compute is not really a bottleneck, but memory is. So if we can enable fine tuning with a smaller number of GPUs, it can greatly improve accessibility to these large models. So how can DeepSpeed help here? So DeepSpeed can replace the data parallelism in 3D parallelism with zero family of technology. Zero provides not just a more memory efficient version of data parallelism, but it can also leverage CPU and NVMe memory. And on modern GPU clusters, each node can have more than four times CPU and NVMe memory than GPU memory. So it can reduce the number of GPUs required by a similar proportion. So for example, to train a 200 billion parameter model, uh, you would just need 64 GPUs um, to fine tune it than, than using 256 GPUs. In addition to leveraging CPU and NVMe memory, one of the main features of Xero is that it removes replication of data across data parallel GPUs by partitioning them instead. This partitioning reduces the memory footprint per GPU, which means now you can fit the same model using smaller tensor parallelism or pipeline parallelism degree. This added flexibility in choice of tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism can help choose better configurations depending on your cluster characteristics. Using 3D parallelism with zero power data parallelism instead of standard data parallelism, we were able to see about a 3.5% improvement on throughput on a 64 GPU DGX2 SuperPod cluster um, for a 52 billion parameter model, for example. The pipeline parallelism implementation in Megatron makes certain assumptions about the model structure and data types that can limit the flexibility in which the model can be modified. Through integration with DeepSpeed, we remove such assumptions, supporting any model that can be represented as a sequence of layers. In addition, the pipeline parallelism in DeepSpeed also supports communication of arbitrary activations and shapes. So the model scientist can make changes to the model more freely without worrying about the compatibility with pipeline parallelism. So with this integration between DeepSpeed and Megatron, we're going past 3D parallelism and bringing in technologies like Xero um, and heterogeneous memory uh, support that can altogether help accessibility, efficiency, and flexibility for big science. Um, that's the end of this video. For folks who are interested in uh, accessing the DeepSpeed and Megatron integration, please take a look at this link. And if you want to learn more about uh, DeepSpeed technologies like Xero and some of the offload mechanisms, please check out uh, the links to our blog post here. Thank you, everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Thomas Yalom, a researcher at Sorbonne University and the startup Recital. And uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Evaluation Working Group. Um, so in this group, one of our goals is to measure how good is a language model. What does this mean? Uh, for that purpose, we want to develop standardized measures for evaluating the models. We also want to design diverse uh, multi-faced suite of evaluations. It means that it should represent different ways in which people will use the language models in practice. Also, the different commun uh, scientific communities 
who are interesting in the capabilities of language models. Um, so we started uh, April 28th with the kickoff, uh, which in uh, included 161 members in the evaluation working group and eight co-chairs. Um, in May, we decided to divide in five subgroups, the old groups, to ensure coverage of all the different priorities, uh, including a, a sub-working group on extrinsic evaluation, another one on intrinsic evaluation, future generalization, bias and social impact, and finally, multilingualism. What do these groups uh, mean? So extrinsic evaluation uh, has a focus on downstream tasks like uh, question answering, summarization, machine translation. Intrinsic evaluation focuses more on encoding of linguistic and the world knowledge. Future generalization has a focus on evaluation of distribution that hasn't been seen during the pre-training. Bias and social impact is more about quantifying in the encoding of stereotypes, the risk of user harm. And finally, multilingualism has to make sure that we coverage all the training and also unseen language in our evaluations. So as you may expect, uh, there's a lot of overlap between the different subgroups. For instance, extrinsic and few shots, um, where, for instance, you want to generalize a QA model, which is an extrinsic tax, on new domains like biomedical. And finally, I would say that multilinguality is at the core of the project, since we want a multilingual uh, large way. Great, thanks, Thomas. Um, I'm Ellie Pavlik. I'm from Google Research and Brown University, and I am one of the co-chairs um, working mostly in the few shot generalization group. Um, so following uh, kind of the initial setup and division of subgroups, um, we've spent most of the summer working within our subgroups um, to kind of define the scope of each of those subgroups and particularly uh, look at things like literature review and what are the main research questions we want to prioritize within big science and what were the evaluation criteria we wanted to use um, to define something like the extrinsic uh, group versus the few shot group. Um, so uh, after spending quite a bit of time on these in our separate groups, um, we've started coming together in the past month or so to um, come up with collective criteria that we're going to use for the uh, for the kind of official big science benchmark. Um, so in mid June, we held a vote on different uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria that we should use um, in deciding what tasks to include in our uh, our uh, benchmark. So uh, early on within each of the subgroups, there was a lot of discussion about kind of uh, you know what is uh, what are we trying to do and how are we differing from ongoing efforts? Um, we discussed things like whether we're prioritizing coverage where we include as many data sets as we possibly can, um, so kind of similar in spirit to Big Bench, um, in, uh, in contrast to focusing on a small number of data sets that, have, um, that are included in the benchmark with a specific role, so trying to minimize things like redundancy and correlation between data sets. Um, we talked about whether we should be a living benchmark, so one that's kind of constantly growing as new data sets are created, or one that is stable. Um, so we fix a set of evaluations um, focused on specific capabilities that we think a language model should have, um, and then allow some comparability over time as we change the model or as new models become available. Um, we talked about the uh, reuse of existing data sets. So there are a lot of ongoing efforts on standardizing evaluation of language models um, and reusing a lot of that work is kind of not only um, kind of efficient, but it kind of minimizes noise in the field and helps kind of consolidate and come up with standards um, kind of with outside of big science as well. Um, but in contrast, there's obviously a lot of things missing in, in, uh, in the currently available data sets. And so we talked about the kind of trade-off between reusing versus creating new, new data sets. Um, so in our survey, there was pretty strong consensus in a lot of, on a lot of these questions um, that we've used to kind of govern our task selection going forward. Um, so uh, nearly everyone agreed that coverage was important in particular, um, making sure we cover a diverse, diverse range of tasks. So everyone surveyed said we should have good coverage of tasks. We should not focus only on QA or only on language modeling, um, but make sure we're looking at you know classification as well as generation tasks and um, kind of uh, academic tasks as well as um, kind of more 
uh, commercial industry tasks. Um, also high coverage of languages um, that's been core to the big science mission throughout and and we all agreed that prioritizing language coverage was important um, and as well as different domains in particular uh, domains with kind of important social applications like biomedical um, the consensus was also that um, the majority of people felt we should be a small bench so uh, we should impose some limits on the number of tasks included we don't want to include every task available but instead make sure that the tasks um, once you run the evaluation, it's clear what each number in a table is telling you, why it's included and what capability it reflects. So um, uh, so find you know one or a small number of QA data sets with kind of targeted interpretable uh, results um, rather than every QA data set available. Um, there was a strong preference to reuse existing uh, benchmarks for the immediate term. So, between now and October, when we're going to kind of deliver this final benchmark, we want to try to build on work that's already been done that minimizes um, or that kind of improves consistency with evaluations that are existing um, with the goal of building new benchmarks um, uh, after that initial deliverable. So kind of ongoing research throughout the rest of big science. Um, and there was consensus 93% of people said that we should um, prioritize reproducibility and accessibility of data sets as opposed to uh, proprietary data sets or data sets that um, uh, that are poorly documented in terms of where they came from. <laughs> um, so then in uh, in July, we focused on aggregating data sets within each subgroup that could be um, that uh, were in line with these criteria and could meet the goals of each of the subgroups. Um, altogether, we have uh, collected data on about 70 um, different data sets, and we collected a very large amount of metadata on each. So um, so it's non-trivial kind of adding um, a data set to our list or required reading the paper, looking for kind of uh, data usage rights, looking for details of how the training and test splits were created. Um, so a pretty thorough analysis of kind of available data sets that we could potentially include in the big science benchmark. Um, and then last week we uh, convened as a full group. So representatives from all the subgroups came together and made sales pitches for kind of the the data sets among these 70 that they felt were the most appropriate for the goals of big science and could um could contribute to the the benchmark that we're creating um and so kind of presented strengths and weaknesses of each data set and focused on what research questions those data sets would answer um so in that presentation um we had a decent number of uh, pitches from each group it varied based on the size of the subgroups and the number of existing data sets that are available in that group um, so, for example, we had uh, 19 different extrinsic tasks presented, four social and um, bias and social impact tasks presented, um, seven different multilinguality ones. Um, and then following that presentation, we asked for, again, a vote from everyone in the group, as well as people outside of the evaluation group who had opinions. Um, and so for each of the presented tasks, we ranked them on a scale from uh, one to five on how, how much we think they would uh they would add how important it was to include the task in our final benchmark um as well as uh opinions about what type of training on the task should be allowed so for some tasks for some of the few shot a lot of the bias and social impact ones um we want to tr test the model without any additional training whereas for perhaps some of the extrinsic ones um we're okay with uh with allowing that task to be seen um during pre-training or during model selection so we uh we asked for people's opinions on that as well um and so uh following that vote we aggregated the results and this is kind of where our benchmark currently stands so um we've taken all of the tasks where the um the average score was greater than four out of five so where the vast majority of people who voted um felt that that it was important to include that task in the benchmark this left us with um seven extrinsic tasks they're uh, covering mostly machine translation, question answering, summarization, as well as aggregate uh, benchmarks from generation and uh, classification from superglue. We have eight intrinsic tasks, which focus on kind of core NLP knowledge. So things like uh, named entities, uh, syntax, and semantic roles um, across many different languages, as well as looking at things like uh, language modeling and world knowledge, um, like factoid information about the world. Um, we have nine few shot tasks, which are mostly grouped into four different um, categories, generalizing to unseen domains, unseen languages, um, unseen tasks, and unseen labels within a known task. Um, so we have uh, different data sets to exemplify each of those types of um, out-of-domain generalization. 
We have four social impact tasks. Um, so focusing on gender bias, on toxicity and social identity, on social stereotypes. And um, it was determined that there were some things that the data sets just don't exist for. So um, we're, there's a work in progress to construct a new minimal pairs task to probe for specific um, uh, pieces of information about how the model encodes social identity. Um, and then the multilinguality tasks have been integrated throughout. So for example, of the chosen extrinsic and intrinsic tasks, um, we are making sure there is coverage of all of the um, training languages. So by kind of expanding and combining data sets to make sure that um, that we can, for example, evaluate machine translation in all of the training languages, um, as well as including data sets that uh, have languages not seen in training um, so that we can test kind of few shot generalization to new languages, including languages with um, with maybe different linguistic properties than the, the training languages. Hi, I'm Dan Garrett uh, from Google Research, and I'm uh, a co-chair of the Multilinguality uh, Evaluation Working Group. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the next steps that we're going to take. So one of the first things that we're going to have to deal with is the fact that uh, when we have lots of data sets, lots of tasks, lots of languages, um, we still need to be able to present uh, a clear, concise, uh, uh, basically a score for a model to say, you know, this, this model is better than this other model in, this, in these particular ways. Uh, doing that by having giant tables of numbers is not really a, a good uh, way to do that. So um, there's going to be some work on figuring out how to how to aggregate across these things. Um, uh, uh, benchmarks in the past have used uh, simple averaging, but we think that there are, are better ways to do that. And so that's one of the most immediate things that we'll, uh, we'll be able to do. Um, uh, we'll, we'll also have to coordinate with the modeling working group. Um, uh, they're making decisions about, you know, which models they're, you know, they're uh, running uh, evaluations and tasks to do that. Uh, when we have things like few shot and uh, zero shot uh, evaluations that we want to do, we need to make sure that they're not including that data or those tasks uh, in their model selection uh, so that we can actually do the, the few shot and zero shot uh, tasks that we need to. Um, we're also going to put together a tech report on the uh, uh, process that we've done so far, uh, uh, how we went about uh, uh, selecting these data sets and these tasks, uh, and you know uh, uh, why we why we chose them and, and the process that we went through, and uh, making that that whole process very open. Um, the uh, the sort of next chunk of work is going to be kind of perhaps the more active part of the of the things, which will be. Um, uh, taking the data sets that we have selected, um, standardizing them into uh, uh, shared formats, uh, writing scripts to do the evaluations, uh, computing the metrics, uh, all of those things. Um, this is something where we'll hopefully uh, get lots of help and maybe even uh, more people joining, uh, uh, joining the evaluation working groups um, because we're going to have to basically uh, divvy up all, all of these different data sets and, uh, and do this work. Uh, one of the other things we're going to have to do is coordinate with the carbon footprint team, uh, because uh, every time that we uh, fine tune uh, for, a, for a specific task or run an evaluation, uh, that uh, information needs to be included in you know, how much computation is used. So collecting that information, aggregating that properly, making sure that all uh, goes into the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the full picture of how much uh, carbon was, uh, was produced. Uh, to do these, uh, to build these models and evaluate them. Um, uh, by uh, October uh, is the date that we uh, are planning to be able to uh, tell the modeling working group and the data governance working groups uh, exactly what tasks we are, would like to use and exactly what data sets so that they can uh, uh, make their final decisions about what data sets and which tasks to use for, for modeling uh, itself. Um, and then the continued work uh, will be the, the uh, in, in, uh, continued research, um, which will include things like uh, like further refining our ideas about uh, how we should aggregate uh, across languages and, and data sets, um, and also looking for places where we feel like there are gaps in the evaluation so that we can uh, uh, con contribute new, uh, new evaluations or new data sets um, uh, to make sure that everything we think is uh, covered is covered. Hi, I'm Oscar van der Rohe, a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam and part of the Bias, Fairness and Social Impact subgroup. We have set ourselves two goals. Uh, first of all, we are working towards a shared definition of bias 
it is difficult to find a good definition because there's no consensus in the literature. And furthermore, a good definition depends on the task, culture, and context. To this end, we aim to answer what kind of system behaviors are harmful, in what ways, to whom, and why. And we are working on a white paper to consolidate our findings. Secondly, we want to work on good benchmarks as we have found that current data sets are lacking on important points for our use case. Uh, then we have a, a call to others. Um, as a group, we are looking for collaborators uh, to, to complement our own background with different languages, lived experiences and scientific expertise. For example, we have no one to represent the South American culture in our work. Uh, and we think it's very important that, uh, that we have a diverse group uh, working on these uh, important questions. Uh, and secondly, uh, the data set creation requires a lot of work and expertise, so you're more than welcome to help us if you're interested. Great, thank you. So uh, as you just heard, there's a lot of work still to do, in particular kind of hands-on work on writing uh, code and cleaning data to get uh, all of our chosen data sets in uh, preparation for, um, for the October uh, deadline for evaluation. Um, as well as work on defining the social impact, um, working group definitions and creating new data sets, and work on kind of visualization and presentation of the results from our evaluation. So if you are interested and not yet involved, now is a great time um, to get involved, and you can do so by signing up for the working group through the Google form um, and the discussion, uh, discussion list, which will get you added to our Slack. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Lucioni and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Carbon Footprint Group of Big Science. And today I wanna to talk to you about the practical guide that we've made for quantifying carbon emissions. So a brief uh, update on CO2, uh, in case you forgot your high school chemistry lesson. So CO2 is a gas of what, which low amounts occur naturally in the earth atmosphere, but whose concentration has been rapidly increasing in recent decades and contributing to the greenhouse effect and the overall global warming of the Earth. So in order to minimize our contribution to global warming as a community, it's therefore important to quantify how much carbon we're emitting with our daily actions, including our personal choices, but currently we're going to be talking more about our professional choices and our research choices, and to reduce it or mitigate that impact. And so the carbon, of the carbon impact of machine learning, what does it represent? So there's different aspects of it. There's the dynamic consumption, there's the model preparation overhead, there's the static consumption of the equipment, there's the infrastructure, the overall life cycle analysis, et cetera. So I'm gonna go through each of these to uh, explain to you what they mean and how they can impact the carbon footprint um, of a machine learning project. So in terms of training consumption, this has been the, the main focus of uh, carbon emission assessment so far. So all of the tools uh, that exist currently and the studies that have been carried out have focused on this, which is essentially what is the carbon emitting emitted by a model uh, when it's being trained. Um, so this can be really big if we're talking about a large data set uh, and a model with many hyperparameters. So a study by Strubell in 2019 um, uh, quantified the emissions of a, a large transformer model, including neural architecture search, so essentially grid search and hyperparameter tuning, and they estimated that its emissions were as much as five cars in their lifetimes. So this depends on many factors. Uh, it's not uh, every neural network that emits this much, so it is going to depend on the electric grid you're using and a type of energy mix, so obviously renewable grids emit less carbon, uh, the energy consumption of the hardware you're using, and training time. So these are all the factors that are taken into account by tools that aim to quantify carbon emitted during emissions um, and that will give you an estimate um, once you're done training your model. There's also consumption at inference, which is a, lot, a bit trickier to, um, to quantify, but essentially each forward pass through a trained model will have some carbon impact. Of course, it's going to be lower than the actual training time because you have uh, forward propagation and backward propagation and, and done iteratively, but still, you can consider that each uh, forward pass through the network will have some amount of CO2 emitted. 
And this will be a specific, specifically a problem when you have always on machine learning systems, which essentially are deployed live and that will be emitting um, carbon uh, essentially 24 seven. So this is the case for things like uh, navigation or speech to text. Um, so you're gonna have these, these small quantities of CO2 that are constantly emitted and we don't have uh, tools to, to quantify this yet. There's also the aspect of the static consumption of the equipment. So obviously when you're training, a neural network, you do have your algorithm that is consuming um, above and beyond what an idle computer would consume or, or server would consume, right? But there are still um, energy consumptions with regards to the rest um, of, the, of, the, of the server or whatever infrastructure you're using um, that aren't necessarily linked to the, to the um, model itself, but should be taken into account. So the static consumption includes electrical costs um, linked to the server power supply, which essentially depends on how efficient your server is, uh, the energy consumption of the motherboard, the network card, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are kind of constant uh, consumptions that don't necessarily um, depend on the load, but that are also not quantified when you're just measuring the carbon emissions uh, emitted during training a model. There's also a really important concept to take, keep in mind, which is power usage effectiveness. So, uh, for example, if you're training, especially in, on the cloud, uh, in a big server farm, um, you're going to have a significant amount of overhead um, that will uh, include, you know, powering the routers, storage servers, the air conditioning, because these servers emit a lot of heat. So all of this is going to add up. And um, in order to have an estimate, you can use a, a metric like power usage effectiveness, which essentially estimates um, the energy consumption of the whole infrastructure. So uh, on average, uh, the reported PUE is 1.58 um, kind of worldwide. So that means that you'll have a, a factor of 0.58. So one would be like the energy you're actually consuming directly and then the rest is overhead. So 37% of the energy consumed is gonna be used for things like data center cooling, lighting and distribution. So that's something you have to add on top of the direct uh, emissions of your model as well. And something that's really um, not well understood so far in terms of um, machine learning is that the whole life cycle assessment um, of, for example, artificial intelligence. So LCA um, is a methodology that essentially estimates um, environmental impact, right? So this can, um, this, this accounts for the whole life cycle of actual uh, hardware and equipment. And this includes the fabrication and transportation of the servers and the chips, their maintenance, and their disposal. So this is this is you know a whole um, you have to take into account the server in its all of its life cycle, and this can be complicated because you know there's a lot of rollover. There's not necessarily a lot of transparency in terms of supply chains. So there's a general lack of data uh, with regards to the life cycle analysis and machine learning and how it compares to direct or static consumption. But recent research has showed that this kind of upfront uh, CO2 emissions that are made during, for example, manufacturing or mining of rare metals, things like that can actually be a huge chunk of the emissions of the overall um, model itself. And there's also other things that are, that are to be taken into account, things like um, upstream tasks like data collection and processing, which can also take a really long time for, for large data sets, uh, engineering efforts involved in deploying models and testing them. So if you have a, a big model uh, that you want to run at the end uh, of, your, of your research project, you're going to have smaller models that you're running in order to make sure that the engineering is, um, is up to, up to uh, the task. And you also have downstream tasks like presentation of the work internationally. Currently, we're lucky in the sense that we're not traveling much for presenting, but still when we travel to present our research at conferences, that obviously also has a carbon impact. And therefore, it's really important to, to keep track of all the experiments, all the aspects um, of the machine learning pipeline, because no matter how small they are, they can add up in terms of the overall CO2 footprint. So, and it has the overall, uh, the added bonus of being reproducible. Uh, so for example, if you're keeping track of how long you've ran experiments on which data sets, uh, on which hardware, et cetera, et cetera, you have more chances of being able to reproduce your experiments later. So this can be done using tools like Code Carbon or simple spreadsheets. It's uh, really up to the user, but the uh, um, idea is to really keep track of every small experiment we run, um, ideally even all the trips we take um, and uh, to share it with our community. So offsetting is uh, another topic that comes up a lot when it comes to carbon emissions. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. What is offsetting? Offsetting essentially 
is compensating for emissions that cannot be avoided. And it's usually done by financing projects that store via carbon capture or reduce, for example, via things like tree planting, an equivalent amount of emissions. So there are uh, international norms like the gold standard that are uh, set. So that essentially say one tree will, will is equal to one ton of carbon in terms of offsetting. So you have these, um, these international standards. Is offsetting a way to reduce your carbon footprint? No, it is not. So what we need to do in order to limit global warming is to reduce our emissions. Offsetting is, you know, once you've eaten your cake, you go for a run um, in order to burn the calories, but you've still eaten that cake, you still had those calories. So essentially, yes, it can be uh, a way of repairing damages once they've already been made. But the most important part in our case is to put the world on a carbon diet and to consume less carbon or emit less carbon. When can it be useful? Of course, there are cases when you have emissions that you can't avoid. So for example, when you have to travel to present your work at a conference, when you have to run X number of models in order to tune your hyperparameters, commuting to your office, et cetera, et cetera. These are of course things that are hard to avoid. So at the end of the day, you can tally up your emissions and offset. But that doesn't mean that the slate is clean because uh, for example, trees that are planted can die and not, uh, and not absorb one ton of carbon. Um, our carbon capture technologies are currently still experimental, so we don't know what the long-term effects of those are. So honestly, offsetting is a last resort. Um, what are the most impactful steps that you can take? Uh, as a practitioner, a researcher, an engineer, reduce your IO, reduce computation, data copying, storage, so really be mindful of um, running experiments of running models and try to ask yourself, do I really, do I really need this? Do I really need to eat this piece of cake? Do I really need to run this model? Choose a low carbon data center. We're lucky in big science that our experiments are being run at, at, in uh, Jean Zay, which is mostly powered by nuclear energy. So very low carbon. But if you are running experiments on your local machine or in the cloud, try to choose a low carbon data source. Um, avoid wasted, wasted resources. Once again, you know, leaving things running for a really long time, or um, you know, you can do random search instead of uh, grid search in order to find hyperparameters. These are also uh, options, and which is really important: quantify and disclose your emissions. We need to get the ball rolling in terms of quantifying how much CO2 we're emitting and the impact that's having on our results. So, for example, if someone runs. Uh, you know, a, a large transformer model for six months and uh, emits X tons of carbon, but then has two percentage points on, um, on a benchmark, is that really worth this CO2? So we should start having this conversation to start, should start being transparent with our CO2 emissions. So you've got tools like Code Carbon, Carbon Tracker, Experiment Impact Tracker that can be directly in included in your code at runtime. So we'll essentially run in parallel to your code and spit out um, an estimate at the end. Or you've got uh, tools like Green Algorithms and uh, MLCO2 Impact that, that are essentially calculators where you still need to know some numbers, for example, the hardware you're using, the time of training, et cetera, et cetera, but that will give you an estimate after the fact. And in both cases, share with your community, um, add to your research papers, and um, hopefully we'll establish benchmarks and start tracking progress. As an institution, uh, deploying your computation in low carbon zones, once again, once you have, if you have a choice of deploying on the cloud, you can pick a data center uh, that's low carbon. So there are tools like Electricity Map that can help you figure that out. Uh, providing institutional tools, so for example, uh, implementing uh, either Code Carbon or one of the other tools that exist internally so people can use them on easily on the on the internal infrastructure capping computational usage uh, can be good uh, because you know sometimes people forget processes are running sometimes uh, there are bugs that have uh, algorithms running for, for for weeks before someone picks it up so if you have a cap at 72 hours or uh, a way to request additional resources above that cap then it's already something and of course carrying out awareness campaigns regarding the environmental impacts of machine learning so currently it's true that um, the overall carbon footprint of machine learning as uh, as a field you don't have the exact numbers once again is not that high but it is growing given the ubiquity of ai algorithms given the ubiquity of the devices that we use and by um, being proactive instead of reactive we would actually have a choice of reducing our footprint as a community um, and once again, as a, as a last resort, we can have institutional offsetting uh, using things like gold standard for the emissions that can't be avoided, things like commuting, business construction, building construction, et cetera. 
thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you learned something useful and you'll start integrating um, carbon emission tracking in uh, your experiments. Thanks.